It has been a crazy year, yeah? COVID equals crazy. And so our expectations are even a little bit different because almost anything can happen. Uh, which is why I chuckled when I saw this meme on Facebook. Sounds like thunder outside, but with the way 2020 is going, it could be Godzilla. Can you relate to this? In fact, I think my favorite meme uh, during this whole time uh, has to be this one. The ladies looking off and saying, me looking outside to see what chapter of Revelation we're doing today. Crazy COVID era. In fact, I heard another story of a, a called worker, a buddy in Appleton, who was already doing something different crazy, a graduation parade. Has anyone been on one of those parade routes yet? Um, and uh, while they were there en route, they get a flat tire. And so as they're going by, waving for graduations, like sparks from the rims, you know, and that's just like typical of the era we're in right now, right? And because there's so many incredible things going on, part of me wonders if when we tell this to our grandkids or to our kids in the future, will they believe us? Let's consider the narrative. You know, grandchild, it all started when this virus that sounded like beer and made us laugh was no laughing matter. It was a time where we ran out of toilet paper. A time where we started cooking at home. A time where the greatest fashion trend was over the mask you were going to wear. It was crazy. It was the same year with an impeachment, with presidential campaigning, and with protests. It was a time when nature was going nuts. Saharan dust storm? Meth gators? Murder hornets? What's going on? We were even so discombobulated that the greatest national security threat, Kim Jong-un, we didn't know if was dead or alive, and we didn't care. And you don't know what they would say? By the way, is he dead or alive? We don't know. We're too busy with other stuff. And they might respond to us, yeah, right. Next, you're going to tell me they required preschoolers to wear masks all day. Come on. I'll believe that when pigs fly. And because this world is filled with such incredible stories that are maybe hard to believe, I thought as we've gathered for a spiritual discussion, it may be apropos to talk about some incredible stories from the Bible that people also say are hard to believe. And so we're going to start a series called When Pigs Fly, all focused on the incredible miracles of Jesus. And real recently, I learned that people have a hard time holding on to them. Recently, I was talking to a young lady about the Christian faith. And it was so awesome to be able to tell her why I love being a pastor. Of the forgiveness that I found and the peace I found over guilt and shame and fear. I love sharing that with all people. But then she was really curious about the Bible. And she asked me a, a question. She's like, when you consider the Bible, do you, do you consider it a literal book or a metaphorical book? And I pause, I'm like, well, that seems like a loaded question. Uh, explain, what, what parts do you mean? And she went in to explain, well, Jesus, I, I was reading about how he fed 5,000 people with a boy's lunch. Like, do you think that's literal or metaphorical? And I answered, I think it's literal. In fact, do you know the linchpin of our faith is a miracle? Because after Jesus died, in three days, he rose again. Do I believe in miracles? Yeah, it holds my whole faith together. But not only that, I was able to tell her that this actually gives me great comfort. Because it reminds me, no matter how crazy life gets during COVID, no matter what comes, a Saharan dust storm, whatever may be, we have a God who's reigning above it all and in control. And so the takeaway that you can write down if you're taking notes and that I tried to share with her as best I could was this. That a God who can do supernatural things, why I love this teaching, is that he can bring supernatural comfort. We have a God who right now stands in control above all things. But before we get into a series on, on miracles, I want to do a little bit of teaching, theologically speaking. And I want to describe the difference between a wonder and a miracle. Are you ready? So, a wonder. A wonder is something that is incredible and maybe takes our breath away, but happens naturally in this world. Example is a sunset. 
the hues of orange and purple and blue, they might be incredible to us, but it's something that happens all of the time. Uh, a wonder might be an athlete, really good runner, maybe someone hitting a home run. So they are incredible, but they're natural. What's a miracle? A miracle is something that defies the natural laws of science, the things that we observe. So when it comes to the sun and the Israelites were fighting and God had the sun stay still for 12 more hours, that's a miracle. When, when a, a dead man raises again and Lazarus got out of the tomb with his body intact, that's a miracle. A distinction is sometimes used when it comes to childbirth. Sometimes a, a new mom will, will say, oh, that was just miraculous the way that happened. And, and truly, when you see all that goes on in order to have a child, it, it is incredible. But, but a woman giving birth, that is a wonder. Do you know what a miracle would be? If at nine months she snapped her fingers and there was a baby, that's a miracle. All right. So as we get into the lesson, today we see someone in a crazy circumstance, and he's not in COVID. Rather, he's struggling with demons. And we see God use his supernatural strength to comfort him and help him. The writer of the lesson today is Luke, who is a doctor. And so if he would know anything that defies the natural order of things, it would be Luke. And he tells us exactly what went on that day. Uh, so we're going to look at this whole account. It's fairly long, so you can remain seated. Uh, but we'll also pick it apart later. Um, uh, but first, hear the word of God. Very powerful. Uh, from Luke chapter 8. Uh, you can follow along here or on the handouts. They sailed to the region of the Gerizines, which is across from the Lake of Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and been driven from the demon, uh, by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned, which, by the way, answers the question, pigs don't fly, they drown. Bad joke. All right, we'll move on. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. The people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the, found the man who from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerizines asked Jesus to leave them because they were afraid. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. These are the powerful and the good words we get to dwell on today. Um, with someone around you, could you just tell them our title? He has power over demons. He has power over demons. What I find interesting is how much there's been an increase of interest in the things of the occult or the dark world. For example, if you go to my neighborhood, um, an observation is I think we decorate more for Halloween than we do for Christmas. Can anyone relate to this? I'm always amazed at the Halloween decorations. Um, I get more questions as a pastor about tarot readings and psychics and uh, astrological signs. In fact, my observation was confirmed by a Newsweek article, and in this article it says that in America, there are 1.5 million witches. 1.5 million witches. Now, they went on to say why that was, and the article recorded this, that it makes sense witchcraft and the occult would rise as a society because increasingly we are postmodern. 
The rejection of Christianity has left a void that as people inherent spiritual beings will seek to fill. And so they went on to describe how witchcraft seems kind of tame, not really satanic or bad. It's just like being open-minded and in tune with nature. And sometimes we see this even in our world. Maybe you know those who, you know, have heard of the Long Island medium. Watch the show. Read an astrological sign. An extension of that is even trusting your fortune cookie. The question is, is the occult and the dark forces, are they real? Of which our lesson answer is yes. And what do they want for us? What is it like to follow down that path, whether it be as a, a witch or a Wiccan, or to be in the occult? As we turn to the Word of God, something that I'm struck by is how awful the dark forces are to this man. What do the demons do to this man? Look again. He was met by a demon-possessed man from the town and for a long time had not worn clothes, lived in a house, but had lived in tombs. Now for me, I, I prefer wearing clothing and I prefer not being in a graveyard as my home. Maybe you'd say the same. In fact, uh, later the, the, the lesson tells us, you know, usually he was bound by chains, but he'd break them and live again in solitary places. Basically, he was used and abused by these demons. The demons didn't want anything good. And so when it comes to the dark forces against us, whether it be the devil or demons, the occult, uh, that's why I love our first lesson that just calls out what's going on. It says, your, can you say this word? Your enemy is the devil that is not looking to do anything good to you, but rather is looking to devour you. And so this is something that should be called out and maybe pretty simple. But devils do not desire your good. When you run down that road, they are trying to make you as miserable as they are. Their destiny is already sealed. And so they're trying to rack you with so much fear and so much guilt and so much shame. The devil is the accuser pointing always at you. Doesn't want you to know the peace of forgiveness. He does not desire your good. So then the question that follows is, why is there an interest at all? If this is just so apparent, why are people pursuing these other paths? Here I'm reminded of a great Christian classic on the subject of demons in the occult. It's called Wizards That Peep by Dr. Siegbert Becker. Uh, it's a great read that will warn you about the spiritual dark forces of this world. But something that always struck me about this book is when Becker was done and, and how he felt kind of released from the study. Because as long as he was doing it, he said he had an unhealthy interest in it. And he knew that this unhealthy interest in the dark world aligned with his sinful nature. Aligned with his familiarity with being a slave to sin. It was not part of his new man that wanted to pursue the things of the dark world. And so devils, they don't des desire your good. And scripture would remind us that there is a spiritual war going on. Paul would say, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, the powers of the dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So devils exist. They don't want your good. But the good news is found when the devils meet Jesus. Did you see what happened? The demon-possessed man encounters Jesus, and what was the reaction? He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want from me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, don't torture me. What do you learn from this verse? You know what I learned? That Jesus, the light, and the dark forces, they're not on equal standings. This ain't Star Wars. You got the light force and the dark, and they seem relatively equal. These demons know they stand under. They have found the one with all power and all authority, and they are shaking in their boots. 
What I love is the idea that the devil, though he exists, is but a dog on God's leash. And these demons are afraid because they know who's got the power. And so you want to know a takeaway? If demons fear Jesus, those in Jesus need not fear demons. You might be in spiritual warfare, but you have one who is so much stronger, he's not even close to equal, they shake in the boots when it comes to Jesus. Someone who understood this was Martin Luther. And in his famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, he spells this out in stanza three. I'd like to read it to you. He said, Though devils all the world should fill, all eager to devour us, we tremble not, we fear no ill, they shall not overpower us. This world's prince may, scow- may still, scowl fierce as he will, he can harm us none. He's judged, the deed is done, one little word and fell him. We have that word, it's Jesus Christ. Though spiritual warfare exists, we know the one standing with the battle one. He is our Savior God. So there's part of me as a pastor that now wonders, where does this all land? Something that I doubt is that we, that we have a lot of in our church family or community who are, you know, partly Wiccan or playing with Ouija boards or, you know, doing those kind of things. If you are, don't do it. Hopefully you've seen caution there. So, so what is the more natural way this lands in us? I think sometimes it's that we're too cavalier with the spiritual warfare going on. And this is what I mean. We allow various thoughts in our minds to linger. We allow evil thoughts against other, whether it be revenge or lust. We allow guilt to oppress, whether the guilt on someone else as we don't forgive them, or guilt in our own selves as we feel we're unforgivable. Where does this land? I think too often we neglect the tool that we need to overcome. We neglect the sacraments and we neglect the word. And because of this, too often we fall. Another thing I think that is all too common is that instead of standing and facing our battles and maybe even bearing under the pain of that, we try to escape with various forms, whether it be alcohol, drugs, buying too much. We escape these things trying to numb ourselves rather than fight the good fight. For all these things, we have reason to repent. And we have reason to turn once again to the only hope we have, our Savior Jesus. And I remind you that his power has remained the same. As he drove demons out that day, he still drives the demons out from our own lives. The demons of guilt and shame, the demons of fear, He's the one powerful over them. In fact, we remember when Jesus went head to head with the devil, and we know who won, tempted three times, but he overcame. We remember the cross of Jesus that fulfills the ancient promise that though Jesus' heel would be struck, what would happen to the devil? His head would be crushed. And from the cross, he speaks words of our release, and he speaks into you, you're loved. He speaks into your life. You're at peace. He speaks. You're forgiven and an heir of the kingdom. How great it is to know the one that stands above. How great it is to peer into the miracles of God and see nothing, no power, is bigger than who he is. And I'm not sure if this is a wonder or a miracle because it happens all of the time, but something that is just crazy is how our God is able to take hearts of stone who only wanted to sin and make them hearts of flesh that beat for him alone. And perhaps that is happening as we hear the word, as the Spirit works. It's a wonderful thing. But as we consider the, the goodness and the glory of Jesus, one of the things that struck me from this lesson is how the people reacted to what had happened. And to set this up a little bit, if you'll permit, have you ever been impressed by the incredible actions of someone else? Maybe even intimidated because they did it so well. 
I'm not sure this is impressive enough, um, but uh, some show that is gaining attraction is The Floor is Lava. And maybe some of you who have watched this show, you're trying to get across the lava into the other place. You might be impressed when someone makes a giant leap. Or maybe you're watching this show, uh, there's one called Don't, where someone is, is eating spicy food, and so you've seen them eat a jalapeno and then a habanero and then a ghost pepper all without milk. That's incredible. There are wonderful stories of human feats we hear all the time. My wife and I were listening recently to a man who was a, a, a veteran, uh, worked on fighter jets, and in Afghanistan had a purple heart because he was shot by a sniper. It's incredible. Not only to work on fighter jets, but to endure that. So we hear of incredible feats all the time. And what is the reaction? Maybe sometimes you've been nervous to meet someone, if you've ever been around a celebrity. Maybe someone you've been intimidated by, and I hope I don't say the wrong thing because you're a big deal. But when people see what Jesus did, it's on a whole nother level. See, he didn't just jump across a table or eat spicy food. This Jesus, they finally see it aright. He is the one who stands so far above, and what is their reaction? When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right mind, and they were terrified. They were now shaking in their boots. The lesson goes on to say that they saw him for who he was, and so they said, would you please leave, because we're not used to this power, and, and we don't want to get it wrong. Please, it's too much for us. And this is what I love about the miracles of Jesus. Because if we understand them, we finally have the correct spiritual lens. We finally see Jesus the way the people saw Jesus. So far above every other thing. What is a murder hornet compared to the Son of the Most High God? In fact, they were afraid. And a great thing for us is this next takeaway. That I believe when we look here, the miracles of Jesus give us a healthy fear for God. An awe, a respect, a we're on holy ground territory when it comes to the sovereignty of our God. And this fear is a really good thing. Do you know why? And again, you can love him. It's not just being afraid, but it's, it's this awe. But if you finally fear ultimately only Jesus, and all of your fear is there, you have no need to fear anything else. Because he stands above it. He stands above COVID, and suffering, and financial hardship, and death. And when I fear God, I fear nothing else. In fact, wise King Solomon, as a premise for his book on wisdom, he said that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of our wisdom. But then what also strikes me about this lesson is the dichotomy between what the demons wanted for the person and what Jesus wanted for the person. When he was with the demons, what, what again was his state? Unclothed, in the graveyards, uh, bound up by chains. When he's with Jesus, it changes in an instant. He's now clothed and in a right mind. The people that come out to him, he's able to say, Hey, hey Jim, sorry about all the crazy stuff I did when I was demon-possessed, but what I really want to know is, how are you doing? And for them to know all the crazy stuff he had done before, this is astounding. The goodness of God seen in his new state. You know why I love God? It's because the one who has all authority and power, the one who we should be afraid of, also only wants your eternal good and what is truly good. Now, what is the good that God wants for you? You know, I was watching an interesting documentary called The American Gospel. And it was somewhat saying that American Christianity has gotten it wrong 
in what expects God to do for them. It was talking about prosperity gospel. That if you just believe enough, then you'll be rich, a CEO, buy an island, buy Tahiti, you know, and never be sick. Is that what God wants for us? To have the American version of success? Is that the good that we're talking about? It hasn't been my experience. More I've seen the goodness of God is when sometimes he takes earthly riches so that we prioritize spiritual riches and see how they come above. More I've seen from God is when he takes earthly strength so that we rely on his spiritual strength, whether it be a sickness, whether it be anxious, overwhelmed. God's goodness does not always equate to our version of American success. But make no mistake about it, he is truly good. And he wants good for you. In fact, every now and then we see that too. Every now and then, the girl says yes, and the meal is really good, and we get to buy that thing. But his good so far surpasses that. I love the brother of James who said this. He reminded us that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of the heavenly lights. And so what we know is that what God wants for you, it is truly good. So what are we to do with all this information? Is there an action step? It's been wonderful to dwell on just the glory of God. But I think we find our action step in what the man did. Now, first of all, did, did you remember he wanted to stay there? It was like the Mount of Transfiguration when the disciples said, can we build a tent? We don't want to leave. Like, you're so great. This is awesome. He wanted to stay. But he couldn't. And God gave him this action step. He said, return home and tell how much God has done for you. That's your homework. And that's mine. And I'll leave it for just this week, but really it's the homework of a lifetime. And so as you go out today, what are you going to tell about the good that God has done for you? It could be as simple as, well, I was missing our community fireworks, but the neighborhood, they had fireworks for days, so I was great. It could be as simple as, in a time we're stuck at home, we have a really good cook at home, or someone who's a whiz with Uber Eats. It could be bigger than that, couldn't it, though? It could be when, like this man, I was released from my chains, whether it be addiction or depression, whether it be being overwhelmed or anxious, and I saw God flip my state as he did for this man. And I'm going to tell people that God can do that, and I'm going to remind them to use the word because that's what it does. But like the man, we have the same story. That though I was held down by demons of shame and guilt and fear, I met Jesus through the waters of baptism, through the word. And he brought me freedom. He saved me. Because he's got power over every spiritual darkness. That's our job, church. That's how we reach the lost. We tell the good things that God has done.